Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. Next conversation this morning is going to be on June 12, and of course, uh, celebrating Nigeria's Democracy Day. Uh, this morning, we're going to be speaking with Dele Faratimi, uh, of course, uh, to share his thoughts on all, as many angles as possible concerning the celebration and uh, the planned protest. Good morning, Mr. Faratimi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Cezai. Good to see Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Uh, welcome. Uh, so let's get straight into it. There's so many angles. I hope that we can cover all of them in the time that we have. Uh, Nigeria celebrates tomorrow. Uh, there is, of course, those who say there is absolutely nothing to celebrate. We are not, you know, fully living in a democratic uh, uh, nation. And then there's those who, of course, would lean on to the um, MKO Abiola perspective and say at least... Uh, you know, one thing was done, you know, that uh, celebrates MKO Abiola tomorrow. So uh, let's get your thoughts on celebrating tomorrow. Do you think that we will be celebrating and should be? You know, <laughs> there was a phrase that popped out when you asked the question. Nigeria celebrates tomorrow. Nah, Nigeria is not celebrating tomorrow. We might mark the day for its um, symbolism. We should mark the day and honor it too because of the sacrifices of those who died, even though the ideals and ideas of that day has never found fruition in the Nigerian state. So yeah, we should honor the memories of all those people who were killed on Ikorodu Road <clears throat> in the run-up to Abacha's emergence, the exercise of the sovereign will of the Nigerian people on June 12, 1993, a day that has never been repeated in the history of Nigeria. Yeah, there is every reason why we should honor the day. But you see, what these um, predators ruling us right now are celebrating is not what those people who died in the lead up to what we're calling a democracy today. This wasn't what they died for. They didn't die to install governors who are functionally emirs. They didn't die so that we would inherit a constitution written by the same men who killed them. Because that's what it is. Where was Abdul Salami when people were dying in 93, 94? He was in his office, enjoying the largesse of office. And he eventually succeeded to power. The same hegemony that had ruled all his life, for whom he worked. Midwife, this one they are calling a democracy now, is a democracy where an attorney general will wake up one morning and say he's banning this. A president will pick a petty fight over a tweet that shouldn't have been, and then everybody should fall in line. And it's a democracy. It's a democracy where they are reviewing a fraud. And if we talk, they are telling us that what we say do not matter, what they agree amongst themselves. But the key thing is this. We have every reason, because we must not forget. We lack institutional memories as a people. So it is important that the symbolism of the day is not lost on those who are alive today and witnessing the return to fascism. However, you, are, you did ask a second question, and that is as it relates to tomorrow's planned protests. Yes. You see, all my life, I have never done tokens. If I, I don't protest for me are reactions. Because yeah, what are you? Who are you protesting to? Actually, they're, they're talking to a man who has demonstrated a murderous capacity for. Look, the Nigerian state, the way it is structured. You go out on the street, the Nigerian policeman sees you as fair game. So I have never seen the. I've never called anyone out to any protest. Let me be clear about this. You do not dictate to the oppressed how we should respond to the oppression. And on account of that, I have always been careful not to be seen as speaking against the legitimate right of any man 
to protest injustice. And it is in that vein that I will say to those who wish to protest tomorrow, they should go right ahead. It's their democratic right. And if the Nigerian state has transmuted into a fascist dictatorship, which I believe it is what it is, then it can go ahead again tomorrow and unveil itself as it has consistently done every time people have attempted to assert their democratic right. But I won't be out there tomorrow. Okay. I won't be out there. As far as that, sorry? M Mr. Farasimi, I need to ask you this question because you said tomorrow is not worth celebrating, you know. I've been speaking to a couple of people regarding the June 12 celebration and, you know, asking some student union leaders who led the movement against the military rule and, you know, supporting uh, MK Wabiola back in 1993. And I asked the question, really, the struggle, you know, against military rule, the struggle for the reinstatement of MK Wabiola, was it all worth, worth it? And he eventually ended up saying it was, you know, because even though democracy is not like we want it to be, you know, military rule is no more. But where do you come in regarding that question? Do you think all that struggle, all that activism was worth it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It was worth it. I was student union president in Lasso, I believe that was 94, 95. And this is what I'll say to you. At least Buari has to pretend that we are in a democracy. He has to pretend, whether he likes it or not. The, and it's not just Buari. Our governors have to pretend we are in a democracy. The ones who rule here in Lagos have to pretend we are in a democracy. The ones who rule everywhere in Nigeria, it's not just Buari. We fall into the consistent error of thinking that it's one man. It's not a man, it's a system. They all have to pretend we are in a democracy. And that is because of the sacrifices made by those who stood up, those who died, those who are in unmarked graves. Just like people ended up in unmarked graves after the 20th of October, several people were in unmarked graves and they still are till today. Unacknowledged. The system did a good job of whitewashing the history. Somebody like Obasan Jokin, he studiously refused to acknowledge the sacrifice of all these people. So yes, the sacrifices are worth it. That's why I can be speaking, knowing that even if they must carry me, they would have to find some charges before they can carry me. That's why I can be speaking, knowing that if they kill me, they would have to explain to people what happened. People die every day in Lagos. It's nothing new. But the fact is that those sacrifices, oh yes, they are worth it. And that is why I said these things are nuanced. We must separate the symbolism of the day from the hollow, vacuous nonsense that these feudal lords are going to be celebrating tomorrow. Okay. No? They are two different things. So there's another, sim <laughs> there's another symbolism I want us to break down here. You've talked about <laughs> how you would not, you know, deny a man his right to express his feelings, you know, through protest. But... I need to ask, tomorrow being Democracy Day and the day marked to celebrate um, uh, MQ Abiola, do you think, or what can a protest achieve? See, every time a man asserts his right, what he is doing is that he is affirming that it belongs to him. In this state where we live, the Nigerian state has already, I don't know how we go about the business of calling what we are in a democracy. So when you still find people, let me be sincere. The day I make a call, it will not be for it. It will not be for a protest. It will be for a national strike. Let's shut it all down and then sit down and talk. I don't do symbols. I don't do reactions. It will be a national strike, and we would all know exactly why we are sitting in our homes. There has to be a clear. It can't be that Lagos is shut down and Kaduna is moving. The people in Kaduna are they enjoying life? The people in Kano is there are their lives easy? The fact of the matter is that we have to get to the point where it is a national thing 
It is not just the Igbo man complaining in Imo. It's not just the Igogo people complaining. It's not just the people in Kankara complaining. It's not the people in Zamfara complaining. It's not the people in Ogoni land. Because the problems are general. It is open to every Nigerian. There is sufficient suffering. The only thing that has been democratized in Nigeria is suffering. Every Nigerian, except the ruling class, even if you are rich, you are suffering in this country. Even no matter how rich you are, you are suffering. The people in Kankara, they are not Yorubas. Right. The people in the government are Yorubas, but how do you think the two correlates? It's the failure of the state. And it is failing because it has not delivered on its promises. All right. If the state is firmly established and equity and justice is common to all, then some of these problems will disappear. Right, Those Mr. people Mr. are Martini. responding the only way they know how. I have said this several times. The Nigerian revolution will start in the northern part of Nigeria. But when you look closely, you find that it's already started. But it started wrongly. It's become religious. People are responding to the extremities of their sufferings. It's become religious. You see, young Nigerians crossing the Sahara, crossing Mediterranean, and people think the revolution has well. They are voting with their feet. They are running away. Look, every democracy is demonstrative. You see clearly in the workings of the state, in its relationship with its people, whether that state is democratic or tyrannical. I have always believed that not, it didn't start with Gwari. Nigeria runs up, is a fascist state, constitutional fascism. Any state where the will of the people does not rule is a fascist state. So are right. you and saying, are you, right. Mr. Mr. Farah Timi, are you saying you disagree with people that say that um, Nigeria is far better under President Buhari's administration in terms of democracy? Excuse me? Some people think that. He has lots of supporters who think he's done very well for the country. They think he has done very well for the country. They are mad. Wow. Uh, Mr. Farah, to me, could we kindly, exactly. my language. They think he has done very, look, maybe you should go and ask the people of Kankara exactly what they think. Ask that headmaster in Niger State. Ask him what he thinks of Gwari's administration. Maybe you should travel down to Igogo and ask them. Go to the markets. Ask them what they think of the Gwari administration. Ask anyone, go across the country. Now, let's get, these things are matters of, is it, it, pocketbook economy. Let, let me put it that way. I hate, when we make it about Bwari, it comes out partisan. It's not Bwari, it is the Nigerian experience. But when you now particularize it to Bwari, I am 53 years old. I was old enough to remember I'm, I'm old enough to remember Buari at his first coming. And I'm old, I am a old man, the head of a home. I once ran a law office. People are, I'm responsible to people. I know how much easier my life has been in the last six years. He's not a function of Buari as a person, but he has worsened the bad situation. Right. That's, what, that's what I was just about to get into. Religious, yeah, Mr. Farah, to me, uh, that, that's what I was about to get into now. You know, there's people, and I'll just quickly also throw this in, there's people who have uh, pointed out the uh, incident in France where Emmanuel Macron was, uh, was uh, assaulted um, and, <laughs> you know, and compared that with um, what happened in Zaria uh, in 2015 with the Shiites. You know, and of course, many other cases in Nigeria where there have been extrajudicial killings and just, you know, complete abuse of uh, power. Um, but you know, I, I want you to speak on that. And then second, also, um, was there ever a time since 1999 that it felt like Nigeria truly had an experience of democracy, where pe people truly were uh, the ones in charge of government, the citizens, the electorate? Uh, was there ever a time compared to where we are today? You've not been listening, brother. You've not been listening. If you've been listening, you get this clear. It didn't start in 1999. 
is a lifelong predilection. I'm 53 years old. I was born during the war. I grew up during the military rule. And I saw the fraud both of 1979, by which I was in secondary school. And I saw the perfection of that same fraud in 1999. I voted in 1993. I know as a fact that the will of the Nigerian people has never once mattered in my lifetime. The first time we tried it was 93. Our will has never mattered in my lifetime. That is one. Now, when you compare chalk and cheese, and you're talking about the Macronite slap, <laughs> let me coin that phrase. A citizen might be stupid enough, break the law to slap his elected leader. That's a citizen. And then he'll be prosecuted under the law, just like he might have slapped you or me or any other person. There is no aggravation to his charges, except there be other circumstances unknown to us. He will be charged for having slapped a citizen. If, number one, let's be clear, there is no way in hell, pardon my French, that a Nigerian is going to have that level of access to a Nigerian head of state. Because he is not a citizen in the first place. The head of state is not going to come anywhere near him to vent his anger. You, have, you, you want to try the number of Bodobodo and DSS and everything that is around the place to ensure that there is no such contact between you, a mere mortal, and a commissioner. Oh, no, sorry, a, a president in Nigeria. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I once attended the funeral of a friend's mom, whose brother was then a minister. So we're in a kitty. The, no, I saw Jagbara guns. They were not escorting the head of state. They were escorting governors and ministers. Jagbara guns. That was what the DSS were carrying. How do you go anywhere near such a person to even administer a slap? That happens where citizens are and leaders lead. In a country where all you have are the rulers and the rules, and there is a vast gulf between them. It's never going to happen, and so forget it. Number one, we are not citizens, and they are not leaders. So it's chalk and cheese. Our situations are completely different. You can't compare the two. Okay, so when we look at the person of MK Abiola, he is revered across mm. Nigeria and beyond. He's a man that would forever be spoken of in a positive light for all the philanthropic uh, movements he did. He, just everything he symbolized when it comes to nationality how he unified the North, the South, and every other part of Nigeria, across religious lines, across ethnic lines, and how Nigerians voted for him, you know, in mass numbers, you know, on that day, June 12, 1993. Many years later, it seems that what, what, the kind of leadership and politics we've been having, you know, comes nowhere close. So what do you think that the leaders of Nigeria now and the leaders of tomorrow can learn from the person MK Wabiola? There are several lessons embedded in the life and times of MKO. And um, pardon me, I'm going to take a little time on the question you've asked because it raises several disturbing issues for me. Moshud Kashima, Olambio, I think Olawale Abiola came from very poor stock. But there was a system as young as Nigeria was. In the, I think at that time, it was even mostly colonial Nigeria. There was a system in place that allowed upward mobility if you had sufficient brain power. So you could move. And it moved across the class lines, became rich, never forgot his roots. Because if you ever took time to listen to him, and I did, and I read upon him, you hear him consistently talking about his very highly disadvantaged background. Embedded in it, you would also hear the story of how he moved by dint of his hard work and his mental acuity. Now, the man's life shows that a functional society can shift people across lines, even though it wasn't exactly one created by the people based on their will. It was a colonial birth. It was 
the growth during the up there during the western region days when there were scholarship and everything i don't come from very rich stock myself well unfortunately i'm not anywhere near as rich as baba may god rest his soul so i can understand and relate to the story i wish i was anywhere near as rich i would love to help people as well but you see that also shows you the poverty of private wealth. Everything Chivenko Abiola did in his lifetime, he did by sheer dint of his own capacities. He did his best. He even lived his life as an example, especially when it came to standing by the mandate of June 12. But what has happened? All of that by one man. The man died and it ceased. It shows you the importance of building a system, a human system that understands that there would always be the weak in need of protection by the strong. And the strongest protector that endures beyond all of our lives is the state. So if we have a state that is equitable, the ideals that the man lived for would be the ideals by which we would all be governed and led. But that is hardly the case today. Those who are poor yesterday got into government today. They are billionaires. They're flying jets up and down the place. Abiola had his jets before he went into politics. What were these ones doing before they ever became anything? So how can they construct a state that is based on ensuring that the mass of the people are lifted out of poverty and allowed the capacity to move across the class lines. We've created a feudal state in place of an egalitarian state. And that wasn't what the man's life was about. Mm. So right. I hope I answered you. Yeah, well, yes, you let, do. Let, let's you. talk about, you know, hopes that we can still fix this. Um, you know, I'm sorry? Let's talk about hopes that we can still fix what we have as our mm -hmm. democracy. There has uh, been mention of a constitutional review um, and some of all of that. <laughs> where, where, would you, where would you suggest that you know, should be our first points of contact if we still want to salvage our situation? Let me say this to you. It is critical that Nigerians begin to speak to themselves across the several divides that our rulers and even we have stupidly created for ourselves. There is hope. We are blessed people. I, I had occasion to address this same issue a couple of days ago. We are blessed people. Nigeria, we are seriously blessed. The tragedy is that we have been horribly misled. We have been led by people whose sole preoccupation would appear to be their appetites, what to eat, what to drink who to sleep with. They are not anchored to higher ideals and goals. So they've, pervers they've perverted the Nigerian people, but there is hope. That hope only comes from us talking to ourselves, identifying a common purpose behind which we would all have to fall behind. We are in dire times. We are in dire times. We have two options before us. One is hopeless, the other is hopeful. Speak to ourselves, find our unity, even in our diversities, and then create a new Nigeria for ourselves. Not that fraud that they are lying to themselves that they are calling the review. Whose interest will that serve? Their own interest. The yeah. same system will continue to perpetuate itself the poor will continue to get poorer. The rich will continue to get rich. And you know what else? They will continue to take away more and more of our rights. We are on the road to Pyongyang if we follow this road that we are on. Yeah, but Mr. 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 me, if, if the persons that you've described, the characters you've described, the system, and those people who run that system, if they don't let go of that system, do you think Nigerians will be able to free themselves from you know the oh, situation yeah, that will. you've described? Oh, we will. 
Oh, and, we will. and not necessarily in seeking secession or, no, no, or no, no, violence. Is, look, let me, let me address that issue once again. I've tried my best to deal with this matter. Secession is a distraction. The powers that be, the beneficiaries of this current system, enjoy it when we speak secession and act secession because it then gives them the occasion to legitimize their venal brutality. They will kill with impunity. They will turn the force of the state, the same force of the state that has been absent in checking the bandits, the terrorists going up and down the place, stigmatizing the entire Fulani nation, those same forces that have not, that has been restrained against those ones will be unleashed. I have never heard of a place where civilians are being bombed, only in Nigeria. And against what? People who are asking to go because you've pushed them to extremes. Let me be clear. Secession is a distraction. But I say this with all emphasis, and I say it knowing that by the grace of God, yeah, I'm not one of those rabba, rabba, shebe, be, be, that will now be praying when they should act. We will act when we will act. But we will act clearly understanding that it's not about secession. Nigerians have to find common cause. The suffering is democratized. There is no part of Nigeria that is working. Why should it then be so difficult for all of us to see clearly that we are commonly afflicted and we should then look for common solutions. So far, right. so far to me, last question for me, what will that common solution be and when will it be implemented? The revolution will not be televised. It doesn't happen. But here is what I can tell you. Nigerians are speaking to themselves across channels. When the time comes, we would all present a joint demand and we'll put it on the table for all Nigerians to understand clearly. No violence. Who are we going to be fighting? If we start anything, it will be ourselves. Nobody will even leave their house by the time, even you, by the time you understand the issues. We're talking about our generations. Are we all going to become refugees? And exactly what I needed to, I needed to emphasize that, Mr. Farad, to me, that your call for revolution is non-violence and that we're preaching no, no, peace no, no, here. No, 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 no. Violence, okay. I don't own a catapult. And you see, when people talk about revolution, I think it's necessary that I clear this up. There has always been this, and it's the military, the Buari, Babangi, Daoba, Sojo class, they gave the word revolution a bad name. Mm. What is revolution? It comes from the Greek word, revolving. What does it mean? It means to turn around. Turn around. We are already heading towards the cliff. A revolution means turn around. Anything that takes us away from that cliff edge is a revolution. And what is the revolution we are proposing? a complete change to our governance system. We have presented the, we presented the constitution, a draft constitution to the review committees that they set up. We know they does been it immediately, but it was never meant for them. It's meant for the Nigerian people. We would take it to the Nigerian people over the coming days, weeks, and months. And when people have sufficiently understood what we are asking of them, we, we put it to the test. Okay. There will be a national strike call. It's not a, no, but I don't own a catapult. I'm not looking for anybody to step onto any street. NLC has lost the capacity to call strikes. And what is the population of civil servants? We will call a national strike. People will stay in their homes. This will not be safe for nobody is coming out to any street to come and throw any stone. Who are we going to be fighting? Is the policeman enjoying his life? Are soldiers enjoying their lives? Who is enjoying Nigeria? If you are enjoying Nigeria, you can come out and join them. But those of us who are not enjoying Nigeria, you see, if we say this is, OK, you are calling strike on what? We will take our time. We will educate our people. And let me tell you something. What they will do tomorrow to those peaceful protesters it will validate what we are saying because every avenue for peaceful protest, expression of democratic rights, have been shut down by this system. So it's either we are going to fold our hand and accept slavery, or we are going to find some innovative way of engaging this system.
to let this system understand clearly that it is not, not only is it not working for us, it is constraining our children's future. So everybody would have to decide whether they are happy with where we are living or whether they seek a change. If we seek a change and we don't want guns, we don't want violence, then we must be able to place alternative ideas on the table that the people might buy into. Okay. Let's put our ideas on the table and allow the Nigerian people the opportunity to decide whether it makes sense or not. Okay. Right. So Nobody glad to know that. Violence. Thank you. Glad to know that the revolution you're calling for is a turnaround in government and, of course, an exchange of ideas. Thank you very much, Mr. Dele Faratimi, uh, for joining us on the much. breakfast this morning. Thank you for having me. And, um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. I was going to say. Uh, Happy Democracy Day. Yes, Happy I Democracy that, Day. That um, June 12 is tomorrow. Also, my mom's birthday. Shout out hey, to her. Happy <laughs> birthday to your mom. Thank you. Um, where was you during the elections in 93? I would have to ask. Did you vote? I would have to ask. Happy birthday? I would have to ask. We need to go. Thanks a lot for joining us all through the week. It's been a very, very interesting one um, with different issues uh, brought to, uh, to the you know, front burner. And we hope that you enjoyed the conversations that we've had all through this week. We'll be back here on Monday morning. If you missed out on any of the conversations, you know what to do. It's uh, on our social media accounts, at Plus TV Africa, on Facebook and Instagram. Same with our YouTube channel. I am Osao Gye Ogbawa. And I am Annette Felix. Have a great weekend. Stay peaceful, stay safe, and happy Democracy Day.